If you have your Bible, I'd like for you to open up to the passage of Luke chapter 15 and kind of hold that. The, the bulk of our text is going to be coming from that this morning. Before we get into that, I want to read to you some of the passages out of Matthew, Mark, and Luke about going and reaching the lost world. In Matthew 28, verses 18, it says that Jesus came to them and he said that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And Mark will record the same gospel commission when he says in Mark 16, 15, that he said to them, go into the world and to preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And then Luke will record a very similar thought in his gospel when he says in Luke 24, 46, he told them this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Recently, I did a, a little survey, and I was asking people um, on Wednesday night and also on Sunday morning what they uh, were looking for on Wednesday night Bible study, some subject matters, books, and different things like that. And I got a whole host of things that came back. But one of the common threads through all of that was the idea and the thought of evangelism. People had on their minds, how is it that we go out and reach the lost? What is it that we do to help reach the lost? And so that began to, I began to think about some of that. And I remember that I had, I had thought about a, a series of, uh, several years ago now uh, entitled Just One. And the idea was the concept of reaching lost people. And I thought this is going to fit in very well, not only because we have this drive for evangelism right now, this thought within the church of evangelism, but also because of what's getting ready to start with our Celebrate Recovery Ministry getting ready to launch in January, and that whole idea of just reaching people who are lost, reaching people who are hurting, reaching people who need help. You know, when we think about our world today, you think about how large it is. There's nearly 6.7 billion people in the world today, and more than two-thirds of that, of that population number has never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. When we think about that number, it becomes unmanageable. We think, how in the world can we reach that number with the gospel of Jesus Christ? How do we, how do we evangelize such a, a huge number of people and such a, a large, vast diversity within that number of people? I don't think that the answer lies within the Billy Graham crusade evangelism method. I'm not necessarily knocking that or anything like that, but most of us are not going to be Billy Graham type of crusade preachers where we're going to have thousands of people come to an arena and hear Billy preach a, a message or someone else preach a message and, and, and respond to the gospel of Christ. But I do believe that one person can make an impact in one person's life. And I think that that's really what Jesus was talking about and teaching his disciples to do when he would send them out in smaller numbers, just go and impact the one person that's in your life. And when we think about doing things by one person at a time, things become more manageable. I want to show you a couple of pictures of some things that are kind of amazing to us as far as modern marvels. The picture right here that we want to see first is of the Great Pyramids. We still marvel today at how these things were built. We don't exactly know how they moved these massive stones weighing many tons each and brought them to this location and then to stack them on one another. But we do know this, that it all started with one stone stacked upon another stone stacked upon another stone. Or even this picture here of the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower, the foundations were laid in 1887, which was, which was before modern building machinery had even come into play. And, it, and we kind of marvel that they were able to build such a massive structure that towers 324 meters above the ground, but we know how it was built by one piece of steel put to one piece of steel put to one piece of steel. Or even the Empire State Building in New York City kind of built out of the end of the Roaring Twenties, completed in 1931, towering over a thousand feet in the air in the New York skyline. And we think, how in the world were they able to build such a building like that? It was able to be built with one brick at a time, one steel girder placed in at a time. You see, I think that that's the same uh, methodology that we need for the gospel message. That how do we reach such a large number of people? We do it by one person at a time, saving one person at a time. In Lehigh Acres proper, there's about 100,000 people, which is estimated from our, our latest polls that were taken here of the population of Lehigh. 
Sometimes I think about how we reach that population number and it seems a little bit impossible. How do we reach 100,000 people with the gospel? But if we start to break it down, it becomes possible. It becomes a reality. And it might happen a whole lot quicker than you think. I started to do some numbers. We average 240 adults on two services in this church right now. 240 adults just in our, our worship services here. If every person in this congregation, every adult that sat in a service in these two hours here brought some to Jesus, that would be 480 people by the end of the year. At that pace, we could continue to reach lost people by every person reaching one person for Jesus Christ. In less than nine years, we would effectively reach all of Lehigh Acres, reaching 122,880 people. And if we kept going on that pace, just our church alone working on that pace, one person reaching one person and those people reaching one people, continue to reach one people, and just over 20 years, we would reach the entire population of the United States, over 300,000 people. In 21 years, you would reach over 500,000 people. The number begins to grow exponentially. And I think that's what God wanted us to do. God understood that one person reaching one person reaching one person and that allows us to achieve the task that he laid before us when he said to go into all the world and to baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ, making disciples to follow in the, in the teachings of the Lord Jesus. And we think, how in the world do we do that? We do that by one person at a time. Everybody can reach one person at a time. There's someone that you work with that doesn't know Jesus that needs you to share the gospel with them. There's someone that you go to school with that doesn't know Jesus that needs you to share the gospel with them. There's someone that you ride on the bus that's never heard about the love of Christ. There's someone that you meet at the coffee shop. There's someone that you buy your groceries from. There's someone that you pay for your gasoline for. There's someone that you meet on a regular basis that doesn't know Jesus that is waiting for you to be the person to share with them the gospel. What I want to do this morning is just kind of talk a little bit about reaching just one person. Jesus told this great story about a shepherd who had these sheep on a hillside and one of them wandered off and what he did to bring that one lost sheep back. What I want to do is kind of walk through that little, that little story that Jesus told and try to lift up a couple of points that we can apply to our lives to say, you know what, if we want to be serious about evangelism, then we need to be serious about asking ourselves, am I reaching at least one person? Because you reaching one and that person reaching one and that person reaching one begins to grow. And then you see the church and the kingdom of God grow the way God intended to. And you realize that it's much more possible than, than what we think. Let me pray for us as we begin. Father God, I thank you for this day that you've given us. I thank you, Father, for your word that guides us and inspires us. It corrects us and trains us in righteousness. Father, it challenges us. To not only understand that we have been saved, but Father, to go and to reach out to other people. Father, that's been our, been our thought, our, our motto here. We talk about connecting people. Connecting people to you in a relationship and to one another for, for security and for comfort and for encouragement. But Father, ultimately we're talking about connecting back to the world. A world that needs to be saved. I pray, Father, that you move in our lives to help us to realize that we need to connect back to the world. Father, we need to get outside of the walls of the church, get outside of our comfort zones at times, and just let your grace be upon us and let it be in the lives of the people we come in contact with every day. Father, give us the words to share. Give us, give us the hands and feet of Christ that we might act in his name to do his work and his will to build his kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In your bulletin, there's an outline that you can follow along as we go through here. Let me just ask the question, does God care about just one person? And the answer to that question is yes, He does. He cares about one person. Sometimes we seem to think that one person doesn't matter and we, we, we sort of push them off to the side and say, well, you know, well, we got the greater crowd here, but the one doesn't matter. But God doesn't see it that way. God saw every person as being valuable, whether they were a tax collector or whether they were a Pharisee or whether they were a fisherman. They mattered to Jesus. And he told several stories about things that were lost. And I just want to focus on one here, and that's about this story of the lost sheep in Luke chapter 15 and verses 3 and following. Let me read this story for you. It says, then Jesus told them this parable. Notice that when Jesus tells a parable, by the way, his parables are always rooted in truth. 
They're never some far out story. The characters might be something that are, are maybe made up. There was a man that was traveling on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And we don't know, he doesn't give us the name of the man and that sort of thing there, but we know there was a road that was traveled from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a common thing. Jesus always tells stories that are rooted in reality. So he tells this story here that has a ring of truth to it because this is how shepherds would have acted. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and he loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and he says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Let me just take and break this story down in about four areas that I think Jesus is speaking to us about evangelism. It starts off in the very first verse there of the story when he tells them this parable, suppose you had a hundred sheep and you lose one of them. I want to say this, that even the lost belong to God. Even the lost belong to God. Just because something is lost doesn't mean that it doesn't have an owner who cares that that thing is gone. Have you ever lost your wallet? Have you ever misplaced your purse, put it down somewhere, can't remember where it was? Just because it was lost, it never meant that it ceased to be yours. And you never said, oh, well, that wall is gone, no big deal. My purse is gone. Oh, well, I don't care if I ever find it back. No, you always want it. You're always longing to have it back. And when it's gone, you fret over it, do you not? I remember riding in Kentucky along the uh, uh, F Highway 52 and I was coming back from New Richmond where my parents lived to where we lived in Maysville and my wallet fell out of my pocket while I was, I was riding my motorcycle back. And I, I just, I remember just feeling that it was gone and it couldn't have happened very long. And I stopped and um, from the time I felt it fall out and it, it probably didn't go two miles. And maybe three or four cars had passed by the time I turned around and got back. I mean, I looked for that thing. I walked up and down for an hour trying to find it, look all over the place. And when I, I, I finally got back home, and I did what anybody would do, right? You start calling, you cancel every credit card. That's in. I had a bunch of church credit cards and stuff in there. I thought, oh, this, this is going to be a bad elders meeting if I got to explain all these charges, you know. And so... <clears throat> I called and canceled all that, and someone had actually driven by in those three or four cars, picked up my wallet, and had taken it to the police station and dropped it off, except they called me after I had called and canceled all of my credit cards and stuff and had to redo everything. The point is this, when it's lost, you want it back, and when it's gone, you're, you're, you're all tore up inside. Where's it at? I can't remember where I put it, and you're all upset over that. You know, God cares about those who are lost. He has a concern. We have the POW MIA flag that says that you are not forgotten. The idea is though we do not know where you are, we don't know what situation you're in, we want you to know that we still think about you. We still wonder where, where you are. We still pray for you. We still long to try to receive you, to bring you back home. We need to realize that those who are lost are not forgotten by the good shepherd. The good shepherd cares about every single one of his sheep, even the ones that are lost out in the countryside. He notices that they are gone. He still hurts for them. He wants the lost to be brought home. He longs for their returning. He, they're still his children. Wayward though they may be, they're still his children. And he wants them to be found. And he wants them to be brought home. But what else do we learn about this parable from Jesus? Look at verse 4. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? The second thing I want us to understand from this parable is that no loss is acceptable. No loss is acceptable. We live in a world of odds. We rationalize that a certain amount of loss is acceptable for the greater success that will be brought in the end. When we're building a building, a house, or some other type of structure, we factor in a certain amount of excess tile that's going to get miscut or broken, boards that are going to be warped and can't be used, you know, shingles that are torn. And, and so we factor in there's a certain amount of excess to a project that we just kind of know is going to happen. We're going to maybe miss, uh, take a measurement and cut a board wrong and it's going to be useless. And so we just factor all that in. When we're producing a drug, we know that there's a certain amount of negative reactions that will occur, but that's juxtaposed against the larger benefit that will take place. And we kind of rationalize things out. We simply just say, well, there's a certain amount of loss. Even in a battle, we, we talk about collateral damage. And we say, well, we know we're going to destroy the enemy, but there's a certain amount of innocent people that might be hurt. And so we, we just rationalize all that away and say, but the greater benefit is this. And let me just tell you that God doesn't do that. 
To God, the loss of even one sheep is not acceptable. Think about it in terms of your own children, especially if you have more than one child in your family. Most of us, I would dare say all of us, would not say, well, one out of two ain't bad. Yeah, one out of three, that's, not, that, that's pretty good, you know. Now, I understand some of our children would push us to want to say that. Believe me, I get that. We might take odds in there. But the reality is, we don't want to miss any of our family. We don't want anyone to be lost. When you say something like that, like, well, I, I have two sons, and, and one of them loves the Lord, and the other one's off in the far country, did that make, does that make you feel better? D does that make you okay with the loss? It doesn't. Because every life matters. Every sheep matters to the shepherd. And no loss is acceptable. God loves a loss so much that he would leave the majority to go out and find the minority. He leaves the 99 on the field side and he goes out into the open country to find the one lost sheep. He travels through the dangerous hillside to find the one lost sheep. And we need to do the same thing today. We need to learn to leave the safety of these four walls to go out into the wilderness of our own community. In here we're friends. In here we find encouragement. In here we think alike. In here we're moving in the same direction. In here we all love and hug one another and those sorts of things. But we walk outside of these walls and we're back in a wilderness world that is antagonistic to Christ. And to those who are following Him. And to those who want to do His will. But that's where we are called to go. We need to have a burning passion for the loss inside of us. Jesus has a burning passion for the loss inside of him. That's why Jesus left the glories of heaven, Paul talks about in Philippians, to come and to die in the form of a man on the cross at the hands of his own creation that he might save them because he loves them and he wants what is lost to be found. And I just want to say, church, if we ever want to grow and do what God wants us to do, then we need to have a passion for the thing that God has a passion for. And what he's most passionate about is not about great music or necessarily great preaching. He's passionate about great evangelism, reaching those who don't know him. He wants as many people as possible to come to know him. And we have to have that burning inside of us. And if we don't, then we are just selfish in our salvation. Selfish in our salvation. No loss is acceptable. What else do we learn from this parable? Let's look back at verse 5. And when he finds it, talking about the sheep, right? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. The third thing I want you to see is this. He cares for the one. It's very clear in this passage that Jesus cares for the one. The shepherd seeks out the lost sheep. When he finds it, he doesn't scold the sheep. He doesn't say, well, I told you, you dumb sheep, you shouldn't have wandered off. He doesn't say, look at all the trouble you caused me. You know, I had to leave everyone behind. I, I put another day on our travel. You know, I could have been doing something else, but no, I had to come out here and find you. He doesn't do that. The shepherd picks up the sheep and he puts it on his shoulders and he carries it home. When God finds his lost sheep, God cares for them. He doesn't bring, he brings them home to make them part of the flock. He doesn't scold them. He doesn't embarrass them. He doesn't humiliate them, but he loves them. But so many times in the church we go, well, I knew I'd find you here in this drunken gutter. I knew you'd have spent all your money. I knew you weren't going to stay with the Lord. I, 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 you know, it doesn't surprise me that you're in this predicament. You know, you brought this all on yourself. We just shoot the wounded. We shoot the lost. We embarrass them. We ridicule them. We cut them down. Folks, we have never been called to do that. The Word of God does that. The Word of God does that. Does the Bible not say that the Word of God corrects us and rebukes us and trains us in all righteousness? Absolutely it does. The Holy Spirit was sent not only as a comforter, but also as a convictor. The Spirit convicts us when we are lost. That is not our job. Jesus told his disciples what? They will know you are my disciples if you love one another. We are called to love each other. We are called to share the gospel with them. Speak the word in truth. But let the word of God do the convicting. Get out of, the, get out of that business. God doesn't need our help in that at all. We need to go out and find them and rescue them. We don't need to be there pointing out their mistakes. We don't need to be the ones that are there saying, well, I'm going to teach you a lesson so you don't ever do this again. Pointing out their actions and how they failed. Leave that up to God. God does it a whole lot better than you and I do. We also might note here that the shepherd carried the sheep home. 
It said that the shepherd puts a sheep on his, on his shoulders and he carries the sheep home. Folks, it's not just enough to tell people to go to church or to tell them that they need Jesus or tell them you got to come hear some sermon. You need to lead people to Jesus. When Andrew met Jesus the first time, you know what Andrew did? It said that he went and got Simon, his brother, and brought Simon to Jesus. He brought Simon to Jesus. And then Peter becomes a disciple of Christ because his brother was involved in bringing him to Jesus. Who are you bringing to Jesus? Just going there and say, well, you ought to go to church. Well, you ought to read the Bible. Well, you ought to pray. That's not enough, folks. We ought to get down beside them and say, let me pray with you. Let me study the Word of God with you. When can we meet? When, when can we share the Word of God? Hey, can I pick you up and bring you to our church? Would you sit with me when you come to our church? We need to be involved in people's lives. The shepherd went out and carried that sheep back to the fold. And, and we need to do the same thing. We need to be reaching people, not just calling people. Evangelism is done best when it's just lived out. As we go about our daily lives, living out Jesus, inviting people into our home, inviting them into our conversation, inviting them into our lives. But so many times we in the church, we just say, you know what, I, I don't want to do that. And, and that's why we have elders. And that's why we have a preacher, because we just send him out. You go out and evangelize people. But that's not the way the Word of God says to do it. The Word of God says that we are all children of God. And as children of God, we are called to reach the lost people. If you're a Christian today, you are called to this task as much as I am called to this task, as much as any leader is called to this task. Now, how does Jesus end this parable? Let's look at verse 6. Then he called his friends and his neighbors together, and he said, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Let me just say as a side note here, Jesus is not saying that there are people who don't need to repent. Everybody needs to repent. All of us have sin in our lives. <clears throat> All of us need to come to Christ. But he's talking about the great joy that happens in the repentance of a sinner. <coughs> so write this down, number four. <coughs> he celebrates every rescue. <coughs> he celebrates every rescue. Everyone in this room, if you've come to Jesus Christ, you have a salvation story to tell. Every one of you. Every one of you who was lost at one time or another in your life and was brought to Jesus have a story, a rescue to tell. You were, you were once walking away from God, alienated from God, an enemy of God, as the Scripture says, in dangers of the flame of hell, and someone came to you and brought with you the gospel message. It transformed your life. You confessed Jesus as Lord, committed your life to Him, made a transformation, began to walk in Him. You have a story to tell, and we need to share those victory stories. You know, so many times in the church, the only person that ever preaches is the preacher. The only person that ever talks is the preacher. But there are stories in the audience, in the crowd right now, about how Jesus has moved in your life that need to be shared, that need to be told. Your testimony needs to be told. You know, I've never won anyone to Jesus Christ by having a theological discussion with them. Now, there might be people who have won that way. I've never experienced that. I've never walked through the Bible and said, hey, this, 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 and look at this evidence here, and, and this is why I believe in God, and, and so I have more evidence than you have, and so now they come to know Jesus. I've never had that experience. Maybe Ravi Zacharias has, because that's what he does. But I've never had that experience. But what I have had is this. I tell people, this is my life, and this was what I was before I became a Christian, and after Jesus got in my life, this is what I am now. And I don't know about you, but I once was lost, and now I'm found. I once was alien from God, but now I'm found in Christ's body. I once was walking in darkness, but now I walk in light. I once did this, but now I do this. Your story resonates with people. And the shepherd comes back and he calls all of his friends together and he celebrates this great rescue. We need to celebrate the rescues in the church. Has God healed you from a disease? then we need to praise God for that and we need to share that story with someone. Has God helped you overcome an addiction? Then we need to praise God for that and share that story with someone because it resonates with someone. Has God restored your business? Then give thanks to God for that and share that story. Has God given you hope? Then praise God for that and share that story. Has He put your marriage back together? Then give praise to God and share the story. Has He given you a new sense of peace and joy and purpose and happiness? Then we need to turn and praise God for that and share that story because someone is 
sitting in the audience and they will hear the story and they'll say, that's my life. That was me. That's, that's what I feel. And if God moved in their life, then that same God can move in my life. And we give praise to God for that. And we continue to share our story because that's what changes people's lives when they see changed lives. And we need to do that. We need to praise his name and let people know that our God saves. We sang the song here, but do we really mean it? I mean, we talk about our God saves, and we ought to say our God saved. He saved me. He saved my life. He saved my marriage. He saved my children. He saved my business. Our God saves, and I want you to know he can save you. We need to be passionate about it and share those stories. Several years ago, I was at a convention, a national Christian convention, and this is the first time I had seen this happen, it was the cardboard testimony thing. Some of you have seen that happen. And, and, and I, I only have a clip I want to show you. It's going to be just a minute or two long. And I want you to see the lives that were changed. Some sheep that were lost that came home. I can't show you the whole thing. It ran about nine or ten minutes. It was an amazing emotional thing. But I'm going to ask him to put this video up here, and I want you to watch and just read. You'll have to read fast. The little things are on these cardboards that people have wrote about. Because some of the lives that are changed in this uh, clip here you're going to see is the same thing that's happening out here. We could do the very same thing here. I just want you to know there are sheep that have come home and there's a rejoicing in heaven. Let's take a look at that clip. <laughs> 